Uh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, today I'm going to tell you about equiangular lines and uh, eigenvalue multiplicities. The main object that we wish to study are equiangular lines and specifically configurations of lines in RD. Let's say all passing through the origin that pairwise make the same angle. Equiangular, equal angles. How many lines can you put in RD all going to the origin so that they all pairwise make the same angle? For example, in two dimensions, if I have to draw many lines, then you can draw three. So you can put down three lines, you pairwise 60 degrees. If you try to draw four lines, you can't make them all equal angles with each other. Two dimensions, the answer is six. There's three. And then three dimensions, it already is not obvious what the answer should be, but it turns out the answer is six. And it's this picture here. You take a regular icosahedron and then you draw the six antipodal diagonals, six main diagonals. They turn out to make equal angles with each other. And this is also the best that you can do. <laughs> <laughs> so, what about other dimensions? The exact determination turns out to be a very difficult problem. And we only know the answer exactly in finitely many dimensions. There are some general bounds. So, there's a very nice upper bound of d plus one choose two from the 70s. In fact, this is a bound that. Uh, as a very short proof using the linear algebraic method. So, for example, I think it might be in the Babai Frankel textbook on linear algebraic methods in combinatorics. It's a very, it's a very nice proof. For a while, people didn't know if this bound was close to optimal or very far away from the truth. And it was somewhat surprising when in 2000, the king found a lower bound that was uh, growing quadratically with dimension. So, for some constant C, there's a lower bound of C D squared. There have been minor improvements in constants and, and whatnot, but more or less, this is the state of knowledge. So we do not know much more than, than these bounds for large dimensions. Let me mention that there is a beautiful conjecture in the world of complex equiangular lines. In the world of com complex equiangular lines, you can imagine instead of in uh, RD, we're now looking at CD and the corresponding quantity, the maximum number of lines in CD pairwise the same angle. There's a beautiful conjecture called Zoner's conjecture. That says that this is exactly D squared for all D. Uh, so, okay, great. So, what do I mean by angle? So, you can imagine you have complex unit vectors, yep. and I take the information in the product and take a real absolute bound. What you take the absolute great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The upper bound also follows from a short linear algebraic argument, uh, but the lower bound is only verified in finitely many dimensions. And physicists actually care about this conjecture because having at least squared equiangular lines in complex space corresponds to an optimal system of quantum measurements. So that's something that comes up in that world, which is not something I'm gonna discuss for the rest of today's lecture, but rather focus on the real case. And- So is this a conjecture that people make because it would be beautiful for it to be true or to show how ignorant we are that even this can't be disproved? Well, we or is have, it something that someone believes? Well, we, it has been verified for small dimensions, let's say up to 20 or maybe oh. numerically up to 40. So yeah, there's strong yeah. evidence. Verified, you mean probably verified. Well, rigorously verified up to some point and numerically verified up to some point. Okay, great. So, so, so the, I, yeah, this is very beautiful, but not what I'm talking about. Not what I will talk about. 
Rather, I want to discuss the problem of what happens if you fix the angle. So back to the real case. So rest of the talk, we're back in the real case. So by fixed angle, I mean I fixed some alpha, and I want to understand what is the maximum number of lines in RD such that your pairwise angle is as given. And the parameterization will be arc cosine of alpha. So alpha is the pairwise unit product between the, the unit vectors on the direction of the lines. And I want to understand what is the maximum number of lines with the given angle. So there's a bit of history on this problem. With, uh, so back in the 70s, Lemons and Seidel first studied this problem. And showed that the answer, if you set alpha equals to one third, which turns out to be a somewhat special value, with alpha equals to one third, the answer is uh, what if they, they determine it for all D, but for all large enough D, the answer is not to be two, two times D minus one, whenever D is at least 15. A very nice formula. That's what I would It took another decade and a half before the next case was solved. Neumeier shows that when alpha equals to one over five, the answer is three over two times d minus one for all sufficiently large d. So you might have to guess that the next case is one to seven. It turns out that that turns out to be much more difficult. And Neumeier even wrote in his paper that there are some barriers in this problem so that his methods will not work for the next case and that he expects the next case to be substantially more difficult. Now, progress on this problem uh, stalled for quite some time and there was a lot of renewed interest when Boris Cook showed that like what these bounds suggest for a fixed angle, the growth in dimension is always at most linear in the dimension. In complete contrast to the case of unrestricted angles, where the number of lines can grow quadratically in the dimension. Fixed dimension, the number of lines can only grow at most linear. Perhaps somewhat surprising. Well, let me point out that in all the constructions for quadratic lower bound, the angles here end up approaching 90 degrees as the dimension goes to infinity. So this does not contradict this claim. So to get quadratically many lines, the angles have to go to 90 degrees. Okay. So it became an interesting problem then to determine what is the optimal constant here? What is the exact growth rate in dimension? So you can ask, well, which angle might give you the biggest possible value of C, for instance? Uh, so there was a work of Bala, Drexler, Ivash, and Sudakov. that showed that perhaps somewhat surprisingly, the constant, the leading constant is actually maximized at alpha equals to one third and strictly less than, 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 than two for all alpha not equal to one third. So this might be surprising because if you look at what I told you here, you might expect the, to, to do better and better when alpha becomes closer and closer to zero. Well, actually no, For fixed alpha, the best value to take is alpha equals to one third. Okay, so it still leaves us hanging. What should this 
number of people? Like, what, what is the actual optimal constant? And that is the main result that is resolved by our work. So this is mostly based on joint work with Selene Chiang, who was my postdoc at the time, uh, Jonathan uh, Kidor, uh, Yuan Yang, who so he was Jonathan Kidor is, was my, is my PhD student, he's going to Stanford in the fall. Yuan Yao is a uh, was an undergrad, a PhD student. Shen Tong Zhang was an undergrad and still an undergrad, and myself. So we showed that for all integers k, the pattern that you see over there indeed continues. The maximum number of echo angular lines was arc angle arc cosine one over the spot integer is given by this formula here. As long as the dimension is large enough. So this continues the pattern for so the next case, one over seven would be four over three as the leading coefficient. Moreover, for all fixed alpha hmm? arbitrary angles I don't see by reparameterizing the to problem so that the lambda okay. equals to one over one minus alpha divided by two alpha. So this is some parameter and it will be significant uh, because it turns out this is related to graph I the number of Equiangular lines with a fixed angle in high dimensions. In fact, it gives you an exact answer in a lot of interesting cases. I still need to define for you what is k lambda. So I stated a theorem, but I didn't define this quantity here. So k lambda is a quantity that we call the spectral radius order. Which is defined to be the minimum integer k such that there exists a k vertex graph whose adjacency matrix has top eigenvalue exactly lambda. So you give me a number. And I search, I, mean, I enumerate over all graphs in terms of their sizes, in terms of the number of vertices. And the first time I see the top eigenvalue equal to the number that you give me, I stop and I record the number of vertices. But give you some examples. Uh, okay. And maybe such a graph doesn't exist. So if there exists, if there doesn't exist such a graph, then we set K to be so just a few examples. When alpha is one third, that was the first example there. If you do the reparameterization, lambda equals to one. You look through all graphs. What is the smallest graph? This adjacency matrix has top eigenvalue one. Turns out to be just a single edge. That's the adjacency matrix. Of eigenvalue is one, and this graph has exactly two vertices. In the next case, we continue when alpha equals to one fifth, then lambda equals to two. The smallest graph with top eigenvalue two is a triangle, which has exactly three vertices. When alpha equals to one seventh, lambda equals to three, and the smallest graph with top eigenvalue exactly three is a complete graph of four vertices. Which has exactly four vertices. And so and this, this pattern continues. But you can also have other interesting values. So, for example, lambda could be one, uh, could be root two, which case, uh, in which case alpha is equal to this funny number. The graph that has top eigenvalue root two, but the smallest such graph is this two edge path, which has exactly three vertices. So k equals to three for this value of lambda. 
So the role of these uh, K lambdas, the spectral radius order, was realized in an earlier work by Celine John and Sasha Podiansky. And we were able to uh, completely resolve the problem showing that the leading constant is precisely given by this number, which relates to K lambda. Any questions at this point? Uh, I mean, you set up an obvious question, which is, does the geometry of that graph tell you how to place the points asymptotically? Perfect. Yeah, I will answer that. Yes, I will answer that. <laughs> Any other questions? So if, if you give me a number, lambda, let's say an algebraic integer, uh, I do not know how to determine k. This actually, I don't even know if this is a decidable question. But it's a well-defined number. Okay, so um, so I stated for you some results uh, about equiangular lines. Now let me explain what it has to do with eigenvalues. So the connection to spectral graph theory. The problem of equiangular lines turns out to be a foundational problem in algebraic and spectral graph theory. So there's this um, yellow GTM textbook by Gaussel and Royal called Algebraic Graph Theory. And in it, one of the chapters is titled Equiangular Lines. And they explain that this is a, a foundational problem. So well, let me explain what is a connection. Right? So what is a connection between equiangular lines on one hand and graphs on the other? So given a set of unit vectors, B1 through Bn in p dimensions. I'm supposed to think of this as um, starting with a set of lines and then putting down some unit vectors, one for each one. I can form a graph. I can form an n vertex graph whose vertices are. They correspond to the vectors, and the edges are such that you have an edge between i and j. If and only if the angle between them is obtuse, so the inner product is minus alpha. So the inner product can be either plus alpha or minus alpha. So I record the sign in the graph. So in this case, if my vectors are a, b, c, then I can draw this graph. A, B, C, and putting edges where you have obtuse angles. So that's the graph. Now, once I give you the dimension and the angle, it turns out that this graph records all the information that is there. So this graph here, it turns out it records all the information. So, so let me try to state this precisely. Uh, there exists an equiangular lines in d dimensions with common angle arc cosine of alpha if and only if there exists an n vertex graph g such that the following matrix lambda i minus the adjacency matrix of G plus one half of J is positive semi definite and has rank at most D. So, this is let me explain what's going on. So, this is actually not, not a deep observation. It's just saying that if I start with a set of equiangular lines, I can assign some vectors, and using the vectors, I can record their grand matrix. I can record the grand matrix of pairwise inner products. So this is so the pairwise inner products as a grand matrix. And up to some scaling, this is a grand matrix. So if I give you a set of vectors, I can produce a matrix. And by virtue of it being a grand matrix, it is positive semi-definite and it has rank at most D because I started with vectors in D dimensions. And conversely, if I have such a matrix, I can factor the grand matrix and recover my set of lines. Here, lambda is connected to alpha, like on the other board. 
that's right. L lambda is precisely just lambda. Uh, that's right. Just lambda. Okay. So with this in mind, the problem, even though we started talking about the geometry of lines, is actually entirely about graphs, finding graphs with certain properties. So to reiterate this point, uh, let me explain how to lower bound this quantity here. So meaning showing you there exists a collection of hyperangular lines with that many lines. So, so how does this work? Well, we start with a graph. H with top eigenvalue exactly lambda. So lambda one of H means the top eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix. The top eigenvalue is exactly lambda. Um, and you can find such a graph with exactly K lambda vertices. So as in the definition of the spectral radius order, I find the smallest graph whose top eigenvalue is exactly lambda. I forgot, what is J? It's, you have plus one half J, what is J? Ah, oh, sorry, J is the O1 matrix. Oh, okay. yeah. I should have said that. So I is identity, J is O1 matrix. Okay. So I start with some graph. Uh, so uh, as an example, when alpha, equals to one third, H is a single edge. And I take my graph G to be a disjoint union of many copies of H, that is my graph. And then if you run through the grand matrix, you see that Factoring the grand matrix, we get a configuration of vectors whose pairwise linear products agree with the specifications. And that's the equiangular lines configuration. And so rather than telling you the coordinates of these vectors, it's much better just to tell you um, if they're whether the pairwise angles are obtuse or acute, and then you can use linear algebra to figure out where the vectors are. So that's the easier direction, that's the lower bound. The more interesting direction is the upper bound. So what is the goal here? So we want to understand an upper bound on this N given D and lambda. So we want to understand what is the upper bound? What's the best? Well, can we find an upper bound on N so that there exists an N vertex graph such that this matrix here is positive semi definite and rank at most deep. And for that, we can use um, a basic fact from linear algebra, namely a, a rank nullity theorem. Tells you that you start with an n by n matrix. So the, the dimension of the matrix is equal to the rank. Plus the nullity of this matrix, which the rank is at most D, and the nullity, well, let me just write that up. Basically, in the algebra, looking at the rank and nullity of this matrix, I can have this, um, this expression. But since J is the O1 matrix, 
and in particular, it has rank exactly one. Removing J from this expression changes this quantity by at most one. So let me not worry about it. So just up to losing plus one, I can forget about the J. Okay, what is this one here? That's the, if it's non zero if and only if lambda is an eigenvalue of the matrix. And in particular, it is equal to the multiplicity of lambda as eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix of G. So you see the connection between these two problems. On one hand, finding uh, the maximum number of equiangular lines. And on the other hand, trying to upper bound eigenvalue multiplicities in graphs. Okay. So the, the rest of this talk, we want to understand you know, what can go wrong. Can this number be really large? If this number is really large, then we're in trouble. So we want to upper bound. So we want to make sure that the second eigenvalue is small. So let's. The most interesting and difficult part of this proof is to rule out possibility. This eigenvalue multiplicity, which I'll denote by mode uh, lambda g, is large. Okay. It, it turns out there's some additional uh, observations that are important to make, namely that. Because this matrix is positive semi definite, the positive semi definiteness implies that uh, for lambda to be an eigenvalue, uh, lambda actually has to be either the top or the second largest eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix. If it's not either the top or the second largest, um, Turns out then this cannot be positive semi definite. I mean, roughly taking away rank one matrix shifts everything by most one position. And so if this is positive semi definite, well, the lambda has to be either top or second largest eigenvalue. So, so there are these two cases. The first case turns out to be easy, and it turns out to be the dominant case. So this is what happens in that example. And the most difficult part of this. Uh, this problem is to rule out the possibility that the second largest eigenvalue can have high multiplicity. Can the second largest eigenvalue of G have high multiplicity? It can, for example, if G is A complete graph of n vertices, the eigenvalues are n minus one once and then minus one, n minus one times. So the second largest eigenvalue actually has max multiplicity really, really high, multiplicity n minus one, which is not great for what we want. Uh, what will happen if your G is, for example, a match? Okay, so have lots of eigenvalues. Yeah, so it turns out that, uh, so I am skipping uh, uh, some logic here, but G uh, should be connected. Oh, G is connected. Yes. I don't have a question, but yeah. I have a confusion yeah. because I'm so used to thinking about Laplacians as opposed to adjacency matrices. Great. Yeah. So. So you already said connected, so that explains to me why the multiplicity of the top one mm -hmm. should be small, right? Yeah, the and top one works. Yeah, by parent convenience, the first eigenvalue has multiplicity one. Uh -huh. Okay. 
right when you are right when, when you are connected. Got it. Yeah. Okay. And the second one, I I'm used to sort of very symmetric things. Typically, yeah. have large multiplicity. Right. So for regular graphs, so if all the vertices have equal degree, then the Laplacian spectrum is just the adjacency spectrum mm -hmm. flipped over. Right. Um, and we scale maybe. That's right. You can keep that in mind, but I, I actually yeah. do need to think about the adjacency. Right. Yeah. No, because you had some non-regular graphs coming up. Right. Yeah. I knew I was going to be confused at that moment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, Laplacians. I know people love Laplacians. It turns out for this problem, we actually cannot work with Laplacians. You have to work with the adjacency. Yeah. But you can keep Laplacians in mind if you're more used to thinking about Laplacians. Any other questions? So it would be nice if every connected graph had small second largest eigenvalue multiplicity. That would certainly resolve our issue, but that's not true. But it turns out this graph just cannot come up in this application. So you know, not all graphs can come up in through through this mechanism starting from equiangular lines. And there is an important step. Uh, towards a solution uh, observed by the authors of uh, erased of Bala, Drexler, Kibash, and Sudakov, they noticed that for every alpha, alpha is the angle, uh, there exists some constant depending only on alpha, not on the dimension, such that okay, initially, look at the picture up there, we made a choice as to on each line, you could choose the unit vector going in one direction or the other. So that there was a choice. And this choice affects the graph. If you make a different choice, the graph becomes slightly different. And the problem doesn't change, but the graph becomes different. What they showed is that you can make the choices so that G has bounded degree. So you can make the choices. So by this, I mean, you can choose either plus B or minus B appropriately. So by making a good choice for each, uh, on each line, I can make it so that this graph has found a different. So we only need to think about bounded degree graphs. So the main innovation in our work is a theorem that says that a connected n vertex graph With bounded maximum degree as second largest eigenvalue multiplicity sublinear in the number of vertices. And the bound that we prove is n over log log n, a leading constant depending only on the degree. So let me write it. A connected bounded degree graph has sublinear second eigenvalue multiplicity. So that's what that theorem says. And precisely, we prove the bound n over log log n. There's a small dependence on delta. This is basically C log delta. Uh, let, let me not worry about that. And so it turns out if you plug that bound into this calculation over here, and then do the rest of the proof, then you arrive at our theorem. Any questions? Let me explain uh, why we have all those Conditions and adjectives. Right? 
each one of them is necessary. So let me give you some near missed examples just to help you think about the theorem of them. So here are some near missed examples. One of them, Sasha already mentioned, if you have a bunch of uh, disconnected components, so matching or a bunch of disconnected triangles, then you see that the top eigenvalue occurs with linear multiplicity. In fact, it's just the eigenvalue, the spectrum of the triangle repeated many times. So it's not connected. It's not a counterexample. There are such things as strongly regular graphs. One example we already saw, uh, the complete graph. Another famous example is the Paley graph of quadratic residues, the Paley graph of quadratic residues. Um, so these graphs only have three distinct eigenvalues, the top one and two others with high multiplicity, but they can never be found in the degree. Okay, not a counter example. Well, another example uh, is if you take sometimes what's called a caterpillar graph. This is the graph, it's a path, and then at every vertex of the path, I have two edges going out. So zero comes up many times as an eigenvalue. For example, if I assign one and minus one to two ends of a, uh, like that, and then all the other vertices zero. You see that this is an eigenvector with eigenvalue zero. And there are linearly many of them. So multiplicity of zero is very high, but zero is not a second eigenvalue. It's very far from being a second largest eigenvalue. Okay. The, the word second doesn't really matter all that much. You can replace second by 10 or any constant j. But we only need second for, for the application. Any questions? I don't know if it's a very simple question, but uh, how is the theorem in the this uh, showing the main theorem? Yeah, so once you have an upper bound of second eigenvalue multiplicity, then uh, it goes into an upper bound here, okay. which upper bounds is n, and the n is the number of equiangular lines. So that's how that's how it fits. Okay. Now I think this is an interesting result on its own, even if you don't care about equiangular lines. Certainly we came to it from this application, but you know it's an intrinsic property of for a very large general class of graphs. Yeah. Can you place second second value this is third second value would bound to be n over log log n? Yeah, so it would be a different constant if you replace second by the j then I would just replace this constant by something that depends on J or a constant J. Or any constant J. Or any constant J. Yeah, I would, we need that for some later applications, but for here, we just need a second. So the problem of uh, eigenvalue, uh, the problem of spectral gap, so how large is the second largest eigenvalue? That's an intensely studied problem because the spectral gap relates to you know, many wonderful things like extension and mixing. But there really hasn't been so much work about eigenvalue multiplicity. In fact, we don't really know other general results or general classes of graphs that are about how large large eigen, second eigenvalue multiplicity. Yeah. How about the results on the collimator of the adding variance? Okay, I can I can I can discuss that in a second. So I actually I recently learned more about it. Uh, it's a great it's a great comment. There is some work in uh, differential geometry, Riemannian geometry, about eigenvalue multiplicity, but not so much in the world of graphs. I won't have time to show you the proof. The proof turns out to be uh, actually quite short, about a page and a half, and uses the moment method. And so we, we consider moments, and uh, there's a very nice trick of uh, if you start with a graph and you puncture the graph by removing vertices uh, in the epsilon net then that actually turns out to significantly decrease the spectral radius. And so we'll use the moment method to, to prove that result here. 
how tight is the step? So this is something that I've been thinking about and struggling with uh, a lot for, for the past while. Um, one of the reasons I care is that if you can improve this down here to, for example, n to the 0.99, I do not know how to do any such things, but if you could do that, then it would significantly improve the quantitative dependence here. So currently, I think what our proof gives is something like double exponential in K. The reality should be polynomial in K. And the main bottleneck, and there are other bottlenecks, but the main bottleneck is this dependence. So for the rest of the talk, I want to uh, discuss what we know about the tightness of this result here. Yeah, feel free to interrupt me with questions. Okay, so what do we know about tightness? Well, first of all, because we use the moment method, where we use uh, counting close walks and use the, the, the trace moment method, it's an analytic method. So there are inequalities. And with inequalities, you always have a little bit of room of fluctuation. You can have a bit of, bit of error and tolerance. So what the proof actually shows, mm. upper bound proof, shows that you have at most Again, with the delta seen as fixed. So with at most n over log log n eigenvalues within a small interval of with one over log n of the second largest eigenvalue. If you actually analyze what our proof does, this is what, what it shows. And it turns out this version, which I'll call star. In a more recent work with some students from Milan Hyman, Carl Schreikraut, Sun Tung Zhang, and myself, all three are undergrads at MIT. We show that this bound here is tight, as in we construct a lower bound showing that this formulation is tight. Maybe I don't actually care that much about. Um, approximate second eigenvalue multiplicities, but what this shows is that there's a limitation to our method. So we, uh, we need to come up with some other methods if you want to improve the n over log log n down. So that's one thing. So let me pose as an open problem. Basically, can you improve this upper bound? Right? So differently stated, what is the maximum possible eigenvalue multiplicity of the second largest eigenvalue in a graph for a uh, connected bounded degree graph? So we prove an upper bound, uh, what are possible lower bounds? Well, so here is a lower bound example. If you take a group that is sufficiently quasi-random, so this is a term invented by Ken Gowers, but roughly means that it has no small irreducible representations. So it's a highly non-abelian, and the classic example is PSL2Q. So a classic theorem of Frobenius tells us that all uh, irreducible representations, that's not other than the trivial ones, so all irreducible representations have to mention at least q minus one over two. Um, so this is that. Um, and some basic uh, principles from representation theory tells us that if you have a Cayley graph, then its eigenvalues come in bundles according to the irreducible representations. So they come in multiplicities according to the dimension of irreducible representations. 
So in any Cayley graph coming from PSL2, so all Cayley graphs on PSL2 have second eigenvalue multiplicity at least of the two, or in fact, at least two minus one over two, and the size of the group is uh, around q q over two. So, so this is a q group lower bound. Yeah. So yeah. why can't it be you know tri the trivial eigenvalue? Uh, uh, so the trivial the representation. Eigen yeah, the trivial representation always corresponds to the top eigenvalue, which is multiplicity one. I don't know. I mean, say, I'm imagining the group is acting on the graph, on the Cayley graph, yeah. right? And mm -hmm. I now take some eigenfunction associated right. to a different eigenvalue. Why can't that? Yeah. So be, if I right. be multiplied by a character or something. Yeah. So if you okay, so um, so it has a bunch of representations, like the trivial one and all the other ones. So the trivial one corresponds to the top eigenvalue, which has multiplicity top. one. And it's only at the top. You're it's saying. only at the top. It's always at the top. No exception, always have a problem because uh, I'll ask you offline about what. Yeah. So the non trivial ones then. So this is one example. So this is a lower bound showing n uh, cube root of n, which is you know, quite far from, from the upper bound that we have. We were able to slightly improve the lower bound. Uh, so in, in the same work, we constructed a different graph, also relying on some representation theory, but you know it's got to do more. Uh, and the lower bound is root n over log n, so roughly square root of n. And in a way, if you rely on group representations, it's hard to imagine getting much better, just because a group of order n, all of its irreducible representations have dimension at most two n. On the other hand, it's really hard to get eigenvalues to collide. As I mean, this is also a general principle in linear algebra. It's really hard to get eigenvalues to collide. They don't collide for no apparent reason, but you have to do something, something miracle has to happen. And here we're you know, using group symmetries to get them to collide. But uh, maybe there are other combinatorial methods to get eigenvalues to collide. Uh, we don't know. So I'll leave it as a, as an open problem that I am very interested in to close the gap between the upper bound and, and the lower bound. And I have, I do not have enough evidence to make a strong conjecture which way, like, I, I don't know, like, I, I don't want to guess which way it is, but I think group theoretic methods get stuck here. Roughly maybe a little bit better, but roughly. Let me mention a few other things that are now known. So since we posted our work, there was a very nice paper by uh, Mackenzie, Rasmussen, and Shravastava. So Mackenzie, Rasmussen, and Shravastava. And they showed that for regular graphs. And more generally for the the, the, the Laplacian, so random walks on graphs. So then they were able to improve our upper bound on the multiplicity to something slightly better from log log n to poly log. Small improvement, but it's interesting. I think because they, they observed some nice facts about the support, the typical support of a random walk. But uh, that, that's, that's one thing that is known. Um, the other only the only other result about upper bounds to eigenvalue multiplicities in graph that I'm aware of is a result due to James Lee and Yuri Mokarica. And this actually has a really fascinating story. I, I just want to say in a second, but first let me say what the result is. Uh, I'll be slightly vague here, but roughly speaking, in a Cayley graph. Really specifically for Cayley graphs with bounded doubling. So what does that mean? Uh, in a Cayley graph, I can look at 
uh, a ball of radius 2r, volume of a ball of radius 2r versus the ball of radius r, and see what this doubling ratio could be. So that's the doubling constant. So if this is bounded, this is okay, then the multiplicity of the second largest eigenvalue is bounded as a function of k. I think it's something like quasi polynomial in k. In particular, uh, so what was an example of a such, uh, such group? So, for example, abelian groups. If you have an abelian group with bounded degree, it always has bounded double. So, this is a fun exercise that is true. So, if you try, want to try to get a better lower bounds, you cannot use abelian groups. Abelian calligraphs are just not going to work. Uh, Neopotent calligraphs are not going to work. They have found a double. Okay, so this is this is okay. um, It also has a really interesting connection to some Riemannian geometry because the ideas for the proof of this vm Karachev theorem actually originates in this famous theorem of Gromov. That uh, Gromov's theorem says that a group has polynomial growth. If and only if it is virtually nilpotent. But it's, I mean, you see all the similar words, but it's like a qualitative version of, of this. So, so there's subsequent work in simplifying Gromov's theorem and quantifying Gromov's theorem. And um, uh, the related result of coding and Minikosi, which says that on a manifold with non positive Ricci curvature, the dimension of harmonic functions with bounded growth has finite dimension. And that's you know, maybe related to eigenvalue multiplicities. So if you think about harmonic functions, that's something that's related to eigenvalues. Uh, so Kleiner found a proof of Gromov's theorem uh, that you know, uses those ingredients, and, and this work quantifies Kleiner's proof. And that's, that's where they were coming from. Uh, and these are, <laughs> this theorem uses completely different techniques from this theorem. Here we use trace method, counting closed walks. Here, roughly the idea is if you have high dimensional eigenspace, then by a um, parameter counting, I can find an eigenfunction with some nice properties. And that would contradict properties of this graph. Right? So it's looking at eigenfunctions. And I really want to combine these two things together but it's, I don't know how to do it. Um, since you mentioned uh, Colin de, de Verdier, let me just mention actually, I recently learned this fascinating conjecture by Colin de Verdier. Uh, here's a conjecture. That if you start with a manifold, uh, so if you start with a surface, uh, X, so, Closed surface, closed compact surface, uh, or okay, let, let's say oriented. Okay, so then you can ask, you get to put a metric on the surface. You, can, you put whatever metric you want on the surface. And you ask, what is the maximum possible multiplicity of the second Laplacian eigenvalue, or the first non zero eigenvalue of Laplacian on this? Uh, on the surface, if you get to choose whatever metric that you want. So that was a problem that he considered. So first of all, already it's non trivial that there, there's an upper bound. So it turns out that it's at most on the order of the genus of the surface. And Colin de Verdier also, first theorem, so Colin de Verdier also prove a lower bound, which is root t. And he asks, what should the answer be? And he conjectures the precise formula and conjectures that this number here should be the maximum possible chromatic number of a graph 
embeddable on the surface. Minus one. And it's roughly on the order of root. Or it's on the order of root of this some constant. So, so this is, it has eigenvalue multiplicity in it. It has some square root and lower bound and almost linear upper bound. And that's all the similarities that I can, I can expect. Maybe there's some deeper connection. Uh, but and the lower bound comes from uh, surfaces that have uh, a Cayley graph like that. Um, Basically, there are different graph. versions of the problem. So, what, the, okay, so you can prove a lower bound using groups. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but he, yeah, okay, so let me leave it at that. Okay, that's it. Are there any questions? Preferably from someone who didn't interrupt. <laughs> well, I'll ask you later about the trivial representation. Okay, so let's uh, thank the speaker again. <laughs>